If you'll turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, one of the most spectacular chapters in Scripture, and I'm getting a little bit of a reverb, uh, Derek. Can you turn me down a little bit? That's great. Perfect. Uh, It's one of the greatest chapters in Scripture, and today we're going to celebrate the certainty of God's love for us, especially as it pertains to the crunch times that come in our life. Uh, When Paul wrote the letter to the Roman church, he was actually doing a fundraising letter, which is why the book is so thorough. It's often known as the mini Bible. But the eighth, eighth chapter in particular is so powerful because when the chips are down in your life, this is the go to text that you're going to want to have in your quiver of texts that you can lean on the Lord with. And so my goal today, quite simply, is to take us through Romans 8, 28 through verse 39. Um, The focus of the text is on God, not on a human response. It's focused on God's love for us in the crunch times of our life. It's only a matter of time before we have the crunch times. I've got an old minister friend who taught me this many years ago. He said, you know, no surgery is a big deal until it's your surgery. Then it's a really big deal. The gun is in your face. Uh, The amazing thing about life is, is that what the Lord wants to do with these promises from Scripture, he wants to move them from theoretical to transformational. The Lord wants his promises to become so real for you and for me that we go, yes, I know this. I know this text because I've experienced in God, in Christ, and his love for me. And that's what this text is about today. So what I'd like to do is take us through this text slowly. And then we're gunning for an end game here today with a testimony of somebody who literally has a gun to their face and is depending on this text. And there's probably others sitting out here today as well that I don't know about who are in a very, very difficult time in your life. And you're wondering, is the certainty of God's love going to be there for me? Let's hear the word of the Lord together. And I'm just going to take us through this text slowly. I love verse 8, 1. Paul starts out, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the first half of Romans 8 is about how the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives so that new things are happening. But as we get to the 28th verse... Paul starts getting down to the nitty-gritty about the certainty of God's love for us in the crunch times. And he says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. A couple things. In 1 John 4.19, John says in that little tiny letter as well, We love God because he first loved us. Isn't it amazing? What Paul is saying in Romans 8 here is, It's all on God. And we have a secondary response. So God, the certainty of God's promises and love to us today are all predicated upon his character and upon his word. And when we are in the crunch time, that's all that matters. It is all that matters. I remember first hearing this text, uh, remembering it actually, as a young boy, age 12, my grandpa Raymaker had passed away, and we went to his funeral up in Sioux County, Iowa. And I I found out this was my grandpa's life verse, and he did not have an easy life. Little did I know that this is the umbrella verse over what's underneath it. What is underneath it is absolutely phenomenal, and you can stand on it in your crunch time. Now, in verses 29 through 30, Paul's going to throw five words at us. Foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. I want you to notice that all those words are in the past tense. So here we go. Read the the two verses, and then I'm going to talk about each one of those words. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So in these first two verses here, Paul's teaching us five terms. The word for know in the Greek is really interesting because it's more than prescience. It's more than having a sense of knowing somebody. What it actually means is that God had a special relationship with you before the creation of the world. Isn't that amazing to think about? We're not cognizant of it, but Paul's alluding to the fact that God knew each one of us personally before the creation of the world. In Ephesians 1.4, Paul again elaborates on this, and he says, Before the foundations of the earth... God called you 
and he knew you. The certainty of God's love toward you today is that he foreknew you. Paul goes on and he says, and he also predestined us to be conformed into the likeness of Christ. The word here in the Greek means literally to pre-horizon. It means to define in advance the limits of, to determine beforehand, to ordain, or to decide upon. So what Paul is saying there is God foreknew you in the, fa- in the past, before you were cognizant of your spirit and yourself, he already decided to throw his mercy upon you of his free will. He chose you of his free will just to be merciful to you out of his graciousness and his goodness. David has a sense of this in Psalm 139, verse 16. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever even came to be. Paul goes on, he uses the word called. In the Greek, it means you were invited. You were summoned into the divine human experience with God. And now you're starting to become aware of a relationship with God. But the Holy Spirit regenerates us. Remember, it's first a work of the Lord to awaken us to our deadness and sin, to draw us to himself. So God calls us. This is really interesting. The call of God to respond in faith brings human will into the center stage, but the divine will has already determined what the final result will be. Remember, this is from God's perspective. God's love for you is absolutely certain, and he is going to make sure of the outcome because he foreknew you, he predestined, and now he's calling you. And Paul brings us to a fourth word. It's the word justified. It's a legal term. Through Jesus Christ, God has justified you. He's declared you not guilty before him if you trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But even the Lord has helped us to move to that place of repentance and faith. That's the love of God. And finally, Paul talks about this idea of being glorified. It means to bestow honor and glory. And God is saying, I'm going to bestow honor and glory on you. And what's fascinating about this text is notice that we've not been glorified in the here and now yet. But in the divine eye, it has already occurred because God is outside of time. In God's mind's eye, he's already glorified you and he's going to lift you up to share his glory with you and with me in heaven forever. So what Paul is saying here in this text is the, is the Lord is telescoping a foreknowledge of us to a glorified state, which is the certainty of God's love for you and for me. But Paul goes on. Let's look at verse 31. Paul says, that's not enough. I'm teaching you. He says, now I want to preach to you. He goes on and he says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, then who in the world can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously Give us all things. In other words, what God is saying is, is stop asking me for the golden eggs. Ask me for the goose. Jesus is the goose who lays the golden eggs. And I want to give you the goose. Now, what's crazy is this, is do we recognize who Jesus really is? Paul wants to make sure that we understand who he is. Since God did not spare him, and he wants to graciously give us all things, who is Jesus exactly? In your Bible, if you keep your hands in Romans 8, if you turn to the right to Colossians chapter 1, you'll find that on page 1164 in your pew Bible. Paul wants to make it exceedingly abundantly clear that we understand who Jesus is. And God is giving us everything in him. And therefore, the certainty of his love is sure because of who Jesus is. And so in Colossians 1 verse 15 through about 23... Paul wants to make sure we understand the depth of God's love for us in Christ. He says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death 
to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and on earth and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So God did not spare his own son. Let's move on with the text, verse 33. We're going to see that God's love is going to get even bigger for what he's going to do for us. Paul writes, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now very quickly, turn back to Romans 8 verse 26. And you're going to see two more things happening here. In verse 26 of Romans 8, Paul writes, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, When I ascend to the Father, the Father is going to send you the Counselor, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, who's going to be an advocate for you. And here again later now in Romans 8, 33, 34, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for you. Isn't that love? Now think of what God the Father has done for us here today to guarantee the certainty of his love for us. In love, he foreknew you. In love, he predestined you. In love, he called you. In love, he justified you. And in love, he glorified you. And right now, the Holy Spirit is within you, groaning regarding your salvation and your sanctification. And Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. And for what purpose? So Paul's been a teacher. He's taught us five things, five words. Paul's been a preacher. He's preaching the Holy Spirit. He's preaching Christ's intercession for us. If we close the text out now, we're going to see that Paul is now becoming a practitioner of faith so that this becomes a transformational reality in our life, that the certainty of God's love is for you and it's for me no matter what happens. So if you go back to your text in Romans 8, let's pick it up at verse 35. Paul says, who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Down to verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's a promise that you can take to the bank when the gun, metaphorically, is in your face. What we want to do this morning now to celebrate our God's great love and the certainty of it is have a testimony shared of somebody who's facing something that's huge. In fact, two people are in our midst. And so I would like to invite Danny Brand up now just to share his reflections on what the Lord is doing in his life. Thanks, Danny. This is definitely, uh, number two, thank you. This is definitely not a place or a time that I ever expected to be sharing something that I'm going to share this morning. Uh, I thank Keith for your words. You, I've, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of things differently than I did two months ago. Um, I've, I, have, I'm, I do pastoral care work here at Third Church. I stood beside a lot of beds of you know, people who are going through some tough times. And I quote scripture like Isaiah 41.10, and he's got you in your right hand, man, I push it up high. And I go to Philippians 4, 6, do not fear, I'm with you. I go to Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 6, and God expresses his great love for us, and he makes it very personal. He knows us by name. He knows each and every one of us. And most of those verses, they all have a preamble to them, and they all talk about do not fear. And Christ must know that we fear a lot because he tells us and warns us many times, do not fear. Because I think when fear sets in, then you you, you leave an opening for the devil to come and, and sit on your shoulder. But let me tell you something that I've discovered. It's a lot easier quoting those verses 
when you're standing beside the bed. It's a lot different when you're in the bed. And that's what I've been experiencing for the last two months. I know that what I'm talking about here this morning is, is going to be tough on some folks sitting out here because I know a lot of you and I know what you're walking through. And this could bring back some sadness. It could bring back some memories of stuff that you've kind of tried to put away, and I don't want to do that. But I think that what I am going to share is important, and I think there's people out here that could probably do this better than me because maybe you've done it just a little bit longer than I have. And I think perhaps you could share these things uh, from your heart. And I'd like to encourage you because sometimes sharing those things with people who are walking through this, if you've been through it, trust me, when I stand, I was at a bedside last week. What I quoted meant a lot more because I was saying it for Denny Brand as well as I was for the person that was in the hospital. So it makes, it makes a big difference. So understand what I'm trying to do here this morning. This is not about Denny Brand. I'm not trying to bring any attention to me, and I hope everyone understands that. Um, let me give you just a little bit of history. Seemed like when I turned 70, everything started to go downhill. To a degree. Uh, I, I was diagnosed with a disease in, in 1970 called polycythemia, which, is, which means my bone marrow, for some unknown reason, decided to make too many red blood cells. And I had what was called sticky blood. And uh, Dr. Westberg was, I was referred to Dr. Westberg and uh, only way you can't cure polycythemia, but you can control it. And I started every two weeks going and getting a, a phlebotomy. And that mean, that's a, they didn't use leeches. They actually used a needle to take it out. But that's what they did for two, every two weeks. And my arm got pretty sore, and he just throw that blood away. But it was controlled, and for the last year and a half, I, I hadn't had any, hadn't even had, didn't even have to have blood draw. But after my blood draw in, um, in November, uh, the numbers were lower than they should have been. And I noticed from then on, I just became incredibly tired. And again, when you get to be <clears throat> our age, they just say it's old age. And uh, I'm thinking, wow, a nap every noon? <laughs> this isn't what I was expecting but I would have to just go home and lay down. And then the very last blood test that I took uh, before <clears throat> the, the blood numbers came back and they had gone completely the other way. And my bone marrow decided to quit making red blood cells. So my, my hemoglobin, I'm, I'm using num I'm names here, I act like I know what I'm talking about, but I knew they were very low. And I was very, very tired. And I just could hardly, I'd walk up the stairs and I'd just be out of breath. I don't know if you noticed my singing this morning. I can't carry a note. I just get so out of breath. I'm just gasping for air whenever I have to hold anything because I'm not getting oxygen to the important parts of my body. <clears throat> so then you start the incredible... Um, tests. And I think all of you have probably, some of you in here have been through those tests. So you start, you do the ultrasounds <clears throat> to prove what it isn't. And then the weight, when you're waiting for those things to come back. Do I have pancreatic cancer? Do I have liver cancer? And you just, when you go to bed the night before you're going to get those results back, you do have a little bit tougher time going to sleep than maybe you did before. And I did a bone marrow biopsy, and that came back. And uh, <clears throat> again, you wait for results. But in my case, uh, I remember talking to Luann, and I didn't have pancreatic cancer. I didn't have liver cancer. And I didn't have any form of leukemia. I'm thinking, I'm home free. 
this is a good deal. Well, after I got back, we went to, Bev and I took a trip to Florida, and we had to go and meet with Dr. Westberg again. And Dr. Westberg didn't spend a lot of time with me, but he was referring me on to Iowa City. And that's the first time I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this isn't so good. And uh, so I went to Iowa City, and I met with um, a, a bone marrow person there and uh, a hematologist. And they told me then, and I got the diagnosis of what I had. I'm going to read that to you, uh, so please forgive me for that, but I think I'll get through it better if I do it that way. The options were what I thought they would be. The only option that would cure the disease is a bone marrow transplant. Usually the cutoff, age cutoff for that is 65. I know it's hard to believe, but I am older than that. I just turned 74. The doctors told me it was a very tough procedure. I would go into the hospital for one week and receive strong chemo. Then for next month, I'd be a patient in the hospital while they injected me with a bone marrow match. The doctor said it would take about a year for me to get well. And there's, at my age, that's a high risk procedure. But now hear me, that's the only cure. That's the only thing that I could have that would make me better. The disease I have is called myelofibrosis. It often happens with someone who has polycythemia, which I was diagnosed three or four years ago. No reason, no hereditary, a gene that just goes rogue. There's a new drug that was approved in 2014 but tested for 10 called Jacophy, which has proven somewhat successful in battling this disease. My blood counts should get better. I should have more energy. My appetite should improve. My spleen should shrink. All those wonderful things should happen. This drug will not cure me, but it will extend my life. The doctors have told me that, give or take, I can expect five years. The other option that I have is to do nothing and treat it with blood transfusions every so often. The downside of that option is my disease that I have is aggressive, and those transfusions would start becoming more and more close together. Till finally that option would be over. And with that prognosis, I have one to two years. Uh, it, It is really strange to be sitting in a doctor's office asking people how much more time you have. Um, never, we're all, we're, we're all going to die. Now, maybe you aren't aware of that, but we're all going to die. But right now, mine is kind of set out here in front of me. I kind of know when, if, unless the Lord prevails, and I kind of know what from. That puts a whole different perspective on what you have. And then you start asking yourself, how much longer do I, what, if, I sev, if I was 84, would I feel better? Would, would it be easier if I was 84? I called my brother, who is 83. I said, Chuck, would I feel better about this if I was your age? And he said, Denny, we always want more. We always want to live longer than what we, are, than what we have. So the only reason I'm up here this morning is not to be but I, but I, what I want to happen is with what I have, I think I have the best platform I have ever had to share God's love and to share his mercy and to share who he is. Um, let me go on and, and read what I said. So this is, this is what it looks like. I don't think anyone is prepared to hear the word cancer. I thought I was, and I was prepared that this might be what I was going to hear. I have talked to both the doctor in Iowa City and my doctor here in Palos Census diagnosis. Bev and I decided that the Jackify option is the best one for me, and doctors concur that as well. I've taken three pills so far, so <clears throat> a little side joke, I took the first pill the other night, Friday night. And I started running around the house 
I told Bev, this pill is instant. I, got, I have energy I've never had before. <clears throat> so I told her she better look out. <laughs> and, you know, we, we decided, Bev and I decided, that to sacrifice is the best option. And we also looked at, I've accepted the diagnosis. Bev and I looked at each other on the drive home from Iowa City. And we committed to each other to make the next five years the best five years we've ever had. Along with Jackify, I'm putting together a team of people who love me and care for me. And I believe in the power of prayer um, more than I ever have before. And I know Jesus can do this. This is the best option of all. Jackify is going to keep me going until I get healed by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. This has all been going on for about two months. During that time, and I, I can honestly say this, during that time there is a sense of being thankful because I have felt closer to the Lord during that time than I ever have. I love my family more, and I guess it's because I take more time to appreciate them. I love my wife more. And I guess it's because we take time now to talk more than in, in a much intimate, deeper level. We aren't, we aren't chasing things around so much. <clears throat> if my life is a book, most of the chapters have been written. I know that I have at least one more chapter to write. And I want it to be the best chapter in the book. I want my life to be one of praising the Lord every day and bringing others to him. And my prayer is that I can do that. Now, I know what you're probably thinking out there. These are just words, and, and I get that. I've sat in your seat, and I've heard guys like me say this stuff. And you think, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds really good. And what you need to hear is that I'm incredibly sad about this. I hate it. If I, could, if I didn't have to do this, I'd give it to you in a heartbeat. But I also know that I have been giving it, and I have a choice. I have a choice to either believe what I've been reading for all these years or turn away. I have chosen to believe what I've read. I know the Lord is going to be with me every step. Excuse me. I did not want to do that. I hate to hear speakers that do this. But I feel like it is my place, and that's why I'm up here this morning, because I want to be able to use this disease, what I have, I want it to be a testimony to other people in the belief of what we have sat. We've sat through how many sermons in our lifetime? Many, many, many. And I have too. <clears throat> Let me tell you, I hear thing, everything different now. And I'm, 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 what I'm asking is don't wait till you get something like this to start loving and being who God has created you to be. Do it now. And you hear everything different. The other day I was riding in my car, truck, and a song came on the radio, and it was, <laughs> I think it was a Chris Tomlin. Is that the singer, Chris Tomlin? And the song he was singing was Going Home. Well, that was shortly after my diagnosis, and um, he was talking about all the wonderful things of heaven. I, I, I don't get it how all of us can go to heaven, and we're all going to like the same things. We're all going to get along. I don't understand all that. Kevin gave beautiful sermon messages on heaven, and, um, but it, 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 that's still, still out there. I, I don't know what that looks like, but I know that's where I'm going. But he was talking about streets of gold and there were no more sickness, no more tears, no more sorrow. And then he said, I'm, you, you, and you get to see the face of Jesus. Now, I want to see the face of Jesus. I do. 
I want to see the face of many of the Bible stuff we read. But you know what I said to the radio at that time? Right now, I want to see the face of my grandkids. So hear me that this is, I've accepted this. I hate it. I don't want to walk through this. If I could, but, but what gave me comfort is listening on Easter Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem full well knowing what he was going to be going through. And he accepted that from the Heavenly Father. But he also, when it came time to do it, Lord, take this cup from me. If there is another way we can do this, I would like to do it. Trust me. If the Lord could take this cup from me, I would give it to him in a heartbeat. You know how you are when you're a kid and you got some big deal coming up and you make a promise to God, God, if you do this for me, I will love you the rest. I'll even be a missionary in China. And this, but this is not deal making. This is, this, this is absolute truth. So that's where I'm at. And, and I, I hope that what I've said this morning maybe resonates with, with you and that as you walk through incredibly tough times, whatever they may be, that you believe the promises that you have read, that you've been told, that you've talked about so many, many times. Um, Sunday was Easter. Last Sunday was Easter as well as my birthday. I don't think that was a coincidence. It had special meaning for me. I am so thankful that we serve a risen Savior, and because he lives, I can live forever. And I said that's kind of a catchy tune. Maybe I should write a song about that. I covet your prayers. I pray that the drug that I'm taking will work in my body that I will have minimal side effects, and that a miraculous healing will occur. I know it can happen. So, blessings to all of you, and I thank you for listening, and uh, I covered your prayers as I walked down this road.